Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. You are watching the Paris FinTech Forum Communities video interview series. I'm Elliot Gotkin, and today I'm joined by the chairman and CEO of Encino, Pierre Nord. Uh, great to have you with us. Nice to be here. Thanks, Elliot, for having me. Okay, so before we get cracking, we're going to learn a little bit more about Encino. So uh, you're a cloud banking provider, I think is kind of what it says on the tin. What does that mean in practice? Yes, we actually uh, focus on a niche in banking, which is all about fulfillment. Banks does three basic things. Onboard customers in a legal and regulatory compliance way, originate loans and make deposits, opening accounts, etc. And we focused on that piece of banking because it's heavy labor intensive, it's highly compliance oriented, and it's a heavy lifting. And I like to compare it to manufacturing. I always tell bankers, you've never thought about it yourself as a manufacturing plant. And how can you actually drive efficiency and better customer satisfaction with those processes? Uh, and tell me about traction, major clients and the like, and, and how you compare with others in the space. Yes, the way I approached the market was to build the basic product, sell it to a smaller set of banks in the US, which is called the community and regional banks, which is smaller, test the product and then take it up market. We then took it up to the up market. Today we have customers like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, et cetera, as customers. Uh, then we moved into Canada and the UK. Today, three of the top five banks in the UK are using us, banks like Barclays um, for commercial lending and business banking. Um, so great traction across all spectrum of banking. We have offices um, <clears throat> in seven countries. We have great customers in France and Germany. So it's truly a global company that scales uh, in all sides of banks. You're still, I think, very much in growth mode. And I think that also means that, that you're still loss making, if I'm not mistaken. Given how much of a focus uh, the bottom line is right now for investors, um, what can you tell me about Encino's path to profitability? Yes, uh, when we went public, we actually made a commitment to the street to be profitable this year. Uh, then we made an acquisition. And as part of that investment and the transformation of that acquisition, we committed to the street to be profitable next year. As you could see from our previous quarter, we improved profitability by 12 million quarter over quarter last year. So I'm highly confident next year is gonna be a profitable as well as a cash flow positive year for us. And what's the overall mission here? What, what is it that, you know, when, I don't, I don't know if you'll ever say job done, but when you'll feel that you've kind of achieved what you set out to achieve? You know, I truly believe banks should operate a lot more like FinTechs with a highly technology enabled customer interface, with a shared purpose where customers can do self-service as well as um, high touch banking with relationship influences, et cetera. But there are so much opportunity in digitizing information, in uploading documents and digitize it, using data analytics, machine learning and AI to automate um, decision-making in banking, removing human biases, et cetera. So I think we can take this industry and automate to the extent where it operate uh, with a very customer centric mission, as well as at an efficiency level where customers expect it today. And the name Encino, what's that about? Uh, in the early days, we didn't have a lot of money. The bank who had the initial idea is called Live Oak Bank, and uh, we couldn't afford to pay marketeers. So one of my guys Googled Encino, or actually Live Oak with Live Oak Tree, and in Spanish, the word is Encino. And so as typical techies, we took the E off and made it N-C-I-N-O. As a Spanish speaker, I feel like I should have known that. But uh, all right, so we've heard about uh, Encino. Let's now uh, get to know Pierre a little bit better. So, uh, Pierre, I understand uh, you, you grew up in South Africa, uh, I think. Um, tell us about, you know, growing up uh, there and, and, and how you ended up where you are today. You know, I was very fortunate. I grew up in the South on a wine, we call it a wine farm. My parents uh, grew grapes for winemaking. Uh, after school, I went to work in a bank and started programming. And, and really was very fortunate. The early days of computing and banking was sent to the US and Europe for training courses, etc., And fell in love with the entrepreneurial spirit of America, just the pace of decision-making, the um, availability of capital and moved here in 87. Um, in the beginning, I was a gun for hire. In other words, I programmed on a contractual basis uh, and, and moved around the country with my family until I was finally asked to start in Sino. And I think somewhere along the way, you, you ended up in Iowa for, for a time. I, I guess that must have been very different to, uh, to growing up in the kind of wine country of South Africa. 
You know, it was quite a test of character. Uh, if you can imagine South Africa feels like California from a weather perspective, and all of a sudden you end up living in a place where there's snow and ice around you for seven months of the year. Um, I actually used the time to study in America and get two degrees because you have enough time at night to do that uh, while working. Um, but it was a great time. Uh, it was a great way to acclimate to America and the American way of living. Uh, and I think it was good for us in the end. And what made you uh, come on board with Encino? Um, in the previous company prior to this was a public company. I was the president of the community banking business. And the people from Live Oak who had the idea to start this company knew me from there. They were involved in the company, um, was the chairman and the fellow president of the business there. And when they started this, they asked me to come and start it. Okay. Uh, and I imagine it, it takes up a good chunk of your time, but uh, I hear you're, you're a bit of a golfer. What, what, what do you get up to in your downtime, if there is any? I love golf. Um, I've done a golfing trip of Ireland with, with four couples. My wife happens to play as well. Uh, and we've done Scotland as well. And it's extraordinary for me to travel around, meet people, interesting, you spend 40 hours on a course, you really get to know someone. Um, I actually use it as a business tool as well. In the US, we invite customers to Wilmington to come visit Encino, take them out for a round of golf, and you build tremendous relationships and understand people's character, their value systems, how they think about life. So I use it as a business tool as well as something to relax with. I suppose it's kind of like the archetypal thing that, that bankers used to do. Uh, sh should more fintech founders, uh, perhaps of a, of a slightly younger bent, uh, get out there on the golf course too, do you think? I, I think you can use it appropriately if you balance it well with your workload and understand that if you play golf in the afternoon, you're going to work tonight. I also tell people you can distinctly identify a banker from a distance. Their swings tend to be better because they have more time for golf than techies like me. Um, but yes, it's a fun, it's a fun uh, way to spend your time with people. Right, I guess the key point there is that you don't knock off after playing golf. That's just kind of like a, exactly. a kind of interruption of your day and perhaps uh, helping the business uh, as a whole. Okay, so look, uh, Pierre, a key part of this interview is to get your take on the future of finance. But first, we are going to take a very quick break, after which we're going to continue our conversation with Encino Chairman and CEO, Pierre Nord. Welcome back, and don't forget if you're not already a full member of our community, everything you need to join can be found at www.parisfintechforum.com. And now, Pierre, uh, let's talk about the future of finance. So, uh, Pierre, Encino had its IPO just over two years ago, I think. This year, of course, we've seen valuations of fintechs and tech companies in general, whether they're private or publicly traded, are uh, falling back to earth. Was this something that, you know, uh, being, I suppose, uh, uh, less involved, if you were looking at this as an outsider, would you say this was something that was long overdue? Um, absolutely. I think you know, the market's overheated at times. We saw the dot-com bubble. Um, I saw the run-up in SaaS valuations in this. We went public. Uh, we went public at thirty-one dollars, and um, the stock shot up to over eighty. And I remind people all the time: you know, do you really think my sophisticated investors would have sold shares at thirty-one if they thought it was worth eighty-one? But that's what markets do, and that's why I educate my people all the time: don't look at the stock price. Let's focus on our customers and our people, and the markets will take care of itself. I think right now, quite frankly, we're slightly undervalued, but you know, over time, that equilibrium will be met again. I suppose as someone that works in the banking space, you have uh, perhaps a, a better vantage point as to the state of the economy and many concerns now that the US in particular is heading perhaps for a recession, perhaps a very deep recession, perhaps it might might miss one altogether. Um, is a prolonged recession the biggest challenge that, that your customers, the banks face? 
You know, banks have a unique situation where with rising interest rates, they typically make more money because there's a lag effect on the deposit side. Um, so banking is doing very well. I speak to many bankers. They feel their credit book is a good situation. So we haven't seen the effect yet. Um, I do believe we have to go through this cycle until we get wage inflation um, under control. And, and that's really the big cost element for most companies. So unfortunately, it's going to take a little bit more pain before we get there. But I do see the end in sight in the next uh, six to 12 months. And in your uh, scenario planning, do, do you, you, you mentioned earlier your plans to be profitable, I think next year. Is that, is that something that would be off the table if there were um, a deep recession? No, not at all. Uh, we've gone through 08 to 12 in a software company like this. I believe digital transformation is a fait accompli. Banks have to do this. If you look at the drivers why banks make these decisions, uh, for instance, ESG, that's a hot topic in Europe. It's coming up in the US as well. We have products to help banks to price for ESG, to actually look at their portfolios for ESG. And those initiatives cannot stop because of economic cycles. Um, what I'm seeing from surveys is that bank spending on IT and tech will go up by 5% again next year. And we're filling those holes to help banks to operate more efficiently. And as, become, as banks become more digital, uh, thanks to uh, Encino and, and others, I suppose uh, there's also more opportunity for, for hacking or for data breaches uh, and the like. Uh, I imagine that although there is a huge amount of things happening on the world right now, which are on the minds of, of, of your, your, your clients, that this is still very much a, a big and, and pressing concern. I imagine that, that your software has to be a, a fortress and likewise for other fintechs that are servicing the banks. Um, how bulletproof can software providers to the financial services like Encino be? Um, and uh, you know, is it inevitable that at some point there will be some kind of breach or some kind of hack that, that will happen. You know, I get asked frequently what I think is the biggest threat to Encino, and I do believe is reputational damage. And that can come in many forms, you know, whether we treat our customers not to the appropriate level, uh, do we have failed projects, etc. cetera. Uh, but then hacking is probably, or a data breach, is one of those big ones. That's why I think it's essential when you build these companies, you pick the right partners and the right platforms. We are built on the salesforce.com platform. And as you look at Salesforce as a CRM company with a lot of customer data, understanding data residency, data privacy, and the amount they invest to make sure that that data security is in place, is phenomenal. It's way beyond what any bank can do on its own. And I don't care how big the bank is, okay? The level of sophistication to these cloud providers has really um, sophisticated and mature products to make sure we stay clean. Uh, so I feel confident we're in the right place. And you mentioned just a moment ago that digitization in the banking space and financial services is, is a fait accompli. It, it's inevitable. It's already, you know, quite advanced and will continue advancing. Um, uh, given what is going on in the economy and we've got accelerating inflation and yes, OK, higher interest rate margins can lead to more profitability for the banks. But maybe there's also concerns about more loans going sour. Um, it, does it mean that right now it, it banks are kind of more prepared to incorporate things like uh, the products and services that Encino is offering? Or is it more likely that they're going to sit back and relax because there's so much uncertainty out there and because they think that maybe they should, should you know, keep, keep their cash close at hand rather than investing it? No, in the early days of Encino, we actually had to explain to banks why it's imperative for them to do what we do. Um, lately, it's not actually how it's, it's, it's more a case of, can you help me to make the business case? They all have to do it. Every developed Western nation is dealing with a shortage of labor as well as an aging workforce. You know, we, we do business in Japan, Australia, New Zealand, all across Europe, US and Canada. And in all of those countries, there's a shortage of labor, wage inflation. They have to do automation. They have to be more compliant. And as such, the pull for digital transformation is massive. And so I don't see a big impact because of this. And in terms of Banks outlook. I mean, you said you know digitization is a fait accompli. Do, do, do globally speaking, do banks kind of understand the urgency, the need uh, for change, whether it's their core banking software or whether it's the onboarding side of things or the way that they uh, they deal with with their their customers? Uh, do, are there still banks out there that don't get it? Um, I would say there's some banks that still believe that it could be a technology solution, and and I want to just uh, draw a distinction there. 
what I mean by that is actually what companies like we do is business process transformation. We redefine your processes and drive optimization and provide a platform that is flexible so over time you can tweak to align your effort and cost along with the risk you're taking. Um, I think banks still believe there's some magic bullet from IT who's going to help them with this. This is a business problem, not a technology problem. In other words, the heads of business have to get involved. They have to work on their credit policies, align risk, align effort and cost. And, and so, yes, there are laggards. There's many of them. There's also an age factor. Somebody may be close to retirement and say, well, you know, my, my successor can come and do this. And I make speeches and comments like this frequently and challenge them. You owe it to your shareholder, to your customer, to your compliance officers, etc., to actually go ahead and become aggressive with this. And given the current situation, we've talked, we've mentioned this already, the, the decline in valuations that we've seen, you know, for many banks and well-funded fintechs, this decline in valuations um, is almost like Christmas coming early for them. You know, there's a huge amount of opportunity now for them to either partner or acquire or merge with companies that perhaps they wouldn't have been able to uh, work with before. Are we in, in your view, are we in for a wave of mergers and acquisitions in the fintech space? Uh, yes, it does create opportunity, but I would caution people to buy things that fit their business architecturally. What do I mean by that? You could be a company just assembling a bag full of tools and try to sell it, but what's the value you add? You're one vendor selling many, many tools that's not integrated. I uh, come from the belief that if you do a client-centric solution that is well integrated and provide a seamless end-to-end -end experience, those kind of companies add value and truly help your customer. So in our case, it's the following. I already have the platform to do the workflow automation, orchestration, etc. But now we're plugging engines of intelligence underneath to digitize, to make better decision, analytics, machine learning, etc. Those are very complementary to what we do. And we inject that intelligence at every stage of production in the banking world. Okay. And so those are the kind of opportunities we will be looking for. So I suppose, generally speaking, the advice would be, yeah, things may be on sale, but just because they're on sale doesn't mean that uh, that you need to you need to buy them. Just think if you would have bought them when they weren't on sale. And also sometimes things are cheaper uh, for, for a very good reason. Um, but I mean, globally speaking, uh, we have seen, of course, banks being increasingly aggressive in terms of acquiring fintechs, even before the decline in valuations. Um, if Encino were ever to um, you know be acquired, do you think a bank would be the most likely buyer? Uh, absolutely not. I, I think you devalue the business by um, a single bank taking the, 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 the software. I'd rather just sell them the software and help them to get there. Okay. I, I think it's a fallacy to think that bankers all of a sudden become technology people and, and run their business like that. Um, I'm a firm believer, stick to your knitting. Um, we are a bunch of technologists. We learn from bankers what they need and how to do things best. I think bankers are very good at the risk underwriting, understand their markets and how to lend money and take deposits and make money that way. Um, so my view is there's a place for all of us in the ecosystem. And uh, given all the things that are happening in the world right now, whether they're financially related or geopolitically related, what, what keeps you up at night uh, in terms of uh, running Encino and uh, helping it continue to scale up? Yeah, there's, there's a number of things. The first one, as I mentioned earlier, is reputational damage. If something would happen from a security perspective, a data breach, etc. The second one is more of a frustration at the uh, slow speed of transformation in banking. Uh, we've got so many proof points. It's, you know, it's got over a thousand banks doing this. Uh, and I still get into countries that I would say is laggards. You know, they think, well, you know, this is the way we've been doing business for 20, 30 years. And, and I don't think I have to do this. And they always wait for somebody else to go first. So the banking industry as a, as a cultural element is by definition conservative. And, and therefore, sometimes uh, I think waiting too long to take the steps necessary to drive that efficiency that they can. Uh, I, I would say that's the bigger frustration for me is that why can't we move faster? You know, when we had the pandemic, uh, we had two great examples. In the UK and Ireland, there was this initiative called Siebel's and Beebles to get money out to small businesses. In the US, it was called Triple P, uh, the Payment Protection uh, Program. In those cases, we stood up solutions in banks in as short as two weeks to start pumping money out. If I would have promoted that product to my banking customers prior to the pandemic, that would have been a 12 to 18 month project. That shows you it can be done. Things doesn't need to take 12 to 18 months. We can do it in a much shorter period. 
And that level of urgency, I think we should get into banking. Right. So pandemic obviously uh, focused minds somewhat more than uh, perhaps perhaps uh, was the norm. Uh, so look, uh, Pierre, uh, it's time now for our round of rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Yes, sir. OK, great. So uh, I've got 90 seconds on my phone's uh, countdown clock. One word answers is all I'm after. And uh, once the buzzer goes, we're going to stop right there. So away we go. What fintech segment uh, besides yours has the biggest potential over the next five years? Um, business transformation. What is the biggest pain point in your everyday financial life that you'd like to see resolved? Um, wealth management aligned with um, the actual value added. Are we at the beginning, middle or end of the fintech wave? Uh, in the beginning. Do, we, do you have a metaverse strategy? Uh, no, I think banking is personal and transactional. Have EU and US regulations kept pace with all the new possibilities and behaviours we're seeing in the financial industry? No. How would you describe NFTs, non-fungible tokens? A, a scam, B, an interesting concept, or C, part of the future that we don't want to miss out on? Interesting concept. Have you ever invested in crypto yourself? No. Are physical points of sale part of the future of finance? Yes. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is the most likely, 1 the least, how probable uh, are the following, how likely are the following to happen in the next 10 years? That one of the neobanks will be as profitable as a top tier legacy bank? Eight. CBDC, central bank digital currencies, become a mainstream reality in the US and EU? A 10. You'll be able to open a crypto account at a top tier bank? A 10. SWIFT will still be the main tool used for transferring money around the world? Five. Oh, and we are out of time uh, for the rapid fire round and for our conversation. So I uh, really just want to thank you uh, for uh, joining me, uh, Encino Chairman and CEO Pierre Nord, for that fascinating conversation. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You have a great day. And uh, for everyone watching, we will be back again next week with another big name from the world of finance and technology. We do hope you'll be able to join us again then. In the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to the Paris Fintech Forum YouTube channel and to follow us on Twitter at Paris Fin Forum. That's all for now. Hope to see you next time. Bye bye.